couple of poems from a collection called The World's Wife, which I wrote over 10 years ago now. And in that collection, what I wanted to do was examine all the fairy tales and myths and stories, episodes from history, characters from popular culture that I'd been taught at school and perhaps more importantly had formed <coughs> my imagination as a writer. And I wanted to retell these very familiar stories and characters um, in the way that Shakespeare demonstrates writers should do, perhaps to find something hidden or surprising in the familiar, um, or simply to celebrate and sometimes to subvert or um, annoy people. <laughs> and the very first story I remembered was the story of King Midas. <coughs> As a child I was enthralled, enchanted by that part of his story in Ovid's Metamorphosis, where he asked the gods that everything he touched would turn to gold. I loved this um, as a child, but as an adult woman writer, I felt very queasy when I came to imagine being his lover, perhaps shortly after the wish was granted. <laughs> so here is Mrs. Midas. It was late September. I just poured a glass of wine and begun to unwind while the vegetables cooked. The kitchen filled with the smell of itself, relaxed, its steamy breath gently blanching the windows. So I opened one, then with my fingers wiped the other's glass like a brow. He was standing under the pear tree, snapping a twig. Now, the garden was long and the visibility poor, the way the dark of the ground seems to drink the light of the sky. But that twig in his hand was gold. And then he plucked a pear from a branch, we grew fundant the tongue, and it sat in his palm like a light bulb, on. I thought to myself, is he putting fairy lights in that tree? He came into the house, the door locked, gleamed, he drew the blinds, you know the mind. I thought of the field of the cloth of gold and of Miss McCready. He sat in that chair like a king on a burnished throne. The look on his face was strange, wild, vain. I said, what in the name of God is going on? He started to laugh. I served up the meal, for starters, corn on the cob. Within seconds, he was spitting out the teeth of the rich. He toyed with his spoon and mine and with the knives, the forks. He asked, where was the wine? I poured with a shaking hand, a fragrant, bone-dry white from Italy. Then watch as he picked up the glass, goblet, golden chalice, drank. It was then that I started to scream. He sank to his knees. After we'd both calmed down, I finished the wine on my own, hearing him out. I made him sit on the other side of the room and keep his hands to himself. I locked the cat in the cellar. <laughs> I moved the phone. The toilets I didn't mind. <laughs> I couldn't believe my ears, how he'd had a wish. Look, we all have wishes. Granted. But who has wishes granted? Him. Do you know about gold? It feeds no one. Aurum, soft, untarnishable, slaked, no thirst. He tried to light a cigarette. I gazed, entranced, as the blue flame played on its luteous stem. At least, I said, you'll be able to give up smoking for good. <laughs> Separate beds. In fact, I put a chair against my door, near petrified. He was below, turning the spare room into the tomb of Tutankhamun. You see, we were passionate then, in those halcyon days, unwrapping each other rapidly, like presents, fast food. But now I feared his honeyed embrace, the kiss that would turn my lips to a work of art, and who, 
when it comes to the crunch, can live with the heart of gold. That night, I dreamt I bore his child. It's perfect, all limbs, its little tongue like a precious latch, its amber eyes holding their pupils like flies. My dream milk burned in my breast. I woke to the streaming sun. So you had to move out. With a caravan in the wilds and a glade of its own, I drove him up under cover of dark. He sat in the back. And then I came home, the woman who married the fool who wished for gold. At first I visited, odd times, parking the car a good way off, then walking. You knew you were getting close, golden trout on the grass. One day, a hare hung from a larch, a beautiful lemon stick, and then his footprints glistening next to the river's path. He was thin, delirious, hearing, he said, the music of Pan from the woods listen. That was the last straw. What gets me now is not the idiocy or greed, but lack of thought for me, pure selfishness. I sold the contents of the house and came down here. I think of him in certain lights. Dawn, late afternoon, and once a bowl of apples stopped me dead. I miss most, even now, his hands, his warm hands on my skin, his touch.